I tried to adapt The Midnight Club in college uh, as a movie. And like I wrote a script for it and I was all excited and I put a business plan together to finance this independent feature and I got in touch with the publishers to say this is what I wanted to do and they sent me a cease and desist letter and ordered me to destroy all the scripts. And um, so ever since then I've been determined to win. And <laughs> um, and so the years went by and I, I just felt like Pike's work deserved its place, you know, in the marketplace and in, in history, uh, the same way Stein and King do. And um, nobody was doing it. Welcome to your first official night in the Midnight Club. There's so many stories about this place. I don't mean to scare you. Stories about people who thought they were gonna die but did it. Good to see you. So they, they got you in. I'm glad to see it. Yeah. Um, well, thank you very much. And so, uh, you know, we've been going back and forth for a while, going all the way back to Hill House, just about how everything that you have done has been very surprising. It's kind of upended the original story, changed it around in different ways. With this, I grew up a huge Christopher Pike fan. And it was like Christopher Pike and R.L. Stein was like the Coke and Pepsi. I'd always get into debates with everybody about who's <laughs> better. And Stein has gotten a lot of adaptations and a lot of shows. We really haven't gotten that for Pike's work. So I know that you're a big fan. What was the, the whole genesis of this coming to be? Uh, I had kind of the same question. I think, Mike, just, I think Mike completely agrees with you. I, I so agree with you. It, my thing was like, where are all the Pike adaptations? <laughs> you know, and Stein was popping. It's like you had Goosebumps and Fear Street and stuff. And it was like, where's, where's Pike? Um, because in that debate of Stein versus Pike, I was Camp Pike growing up. And so um, I tried to adapt The Midnight Club in college uh, as a movie. And like I wrote a script for it and I was all excited and I put a business plan together to finance this independent feature. And I got in touch with the publishers to say this is what I wanted to do. And they sent me a cease and desist letter and ordered me to destroy all the scripts. <laughs> And um, so ever since then, I've been determined to win. And, <laughs> um, and so the years went by and I, I just felt like Pike's work deserved its place, you know, in the marketplace and in, in history, uh, the same way Stein and King do. And um, nobody was doing it. I, I finally just poked around on Facebook and I found him on Facebook in about five minutes and just sent him a message and said, I'm a huge fan and I've been working in movies and TV. Um, and I'd love to chat with you about adapting some of your stuff. And he wrote me back, we got on the phone and the rest is kind of history. Um, but I, you know, I think something happened in near the end of the nineties where and it you know he he'll point to things like harry potter that kind of came in and completely just overwhelmed All the ya the, market yeah. and changed the playing field but i remember walking into bookstores in the pike section you know just leaping out because of the, the colors like i'm wearing this today because it's like pike colors totally. like you could see it from across the room and that was that was a staple for me and i would run to it and like that just faded away and I miss it. So th this was a real honor just as a fan uh, to be able to be a, a part of helping to introduce a new generation to his stuff. Cause I think it's so great. I'm Dr. Georgina Stanton. Welcome to Brightcliff. Every living day here is a win. How long have you all been here? Uh, four months for me. Five. Three. Three. 63 days, 17 hours, and 11 minutes. You don't know the minutes. I'm, not gonna lie. I'm going to die. All of us here are dying. This is a hospice. My parents told me this was a boarding school. What's in the basement? I dare you. No, he doesn't. It takes a lot to scare me. No, wait, don't. Don't. Don't actually go down there. And one of the fears that I think everybody has when it comes to what is categorized as young adult works and adaptations is that it's going to be pandering and cheesy and it's going to be like a, a 
teen show that we see on the Disney Channel where it's not going to be truly scary, but this feels like the 90s equivalent of The Breakfast Club because the characters talk the way that I remember talking in high school and none of the interactions feel like this is a show for teens. It feels like this is a show for characters that are of this age. So did you have any fears, either of you, when this was kind of being built, that this was going to have to evolve into something more mature than the source material? No, yeah. is the short answer. Like we, the, the thing that like, there's, you know, there's some stuff in, in Pike that feels very much of the moment. And, but one of the things that doesn't is he always treats his young protagonists with respect and doesn't pull any punches. And so like that was something we talked about from the minute we started talking about the show as something we wanted to do. Um, so, because yeah, it's like they, I mean, I, I don't think you'd expect a, you know, like a, I mean, my daughter watches the Disney Channel, so I'm not dissing them, but like the, the uh, you know, I, I don't think we would, you wouldn't expect that kind of thing from us anyway, mm -hmm. but it, it, you know, when we're reaching out to, you know, an audience that may not have seen some of the stuff we've done before, it's like, we wanted to imbue it with the same level of depth of character and agency and you know, that the, the you've seen in our other stuff, but also that you've seen from Pike. Yeah, he always treated his teens like grownups. And, yeah. you know, I, I think that's something that resonated very powerfully with me, uh, reading him growing up and, and became a, a mission of the show. Um, I hope I hope we succeeded, you know, because you, you mentioned it's like, yo, you remember talking this way yeah, and feeling this way in the 90s but we were also like what are the kids today looking for what do they talk about and and that was something for us that's like that's it that world is alien um and so we had some younger people in the writer's room who helped shape that as well but that's one of the reasons we said it in the 90s was also like you know at least that's something we understand mm -hmm. and hopefully you know i'd like to think that the emotional experience of being a teenager has a lot of universal elements and even oh, if yeah. you know, we've aged out of understanding <laughs> what today is like to be a teen, you know, hopefully there's enough common ground there that there's something for them to grab onto. What is this? It's kind of a club. You guys sneak into the library every night and make ghosts. Tell stories. Make ghosts sounds better. talking about the, the Nintendo 64, Super Nintendo, PlayStation, all those things coming and just, you know, kind of the way that people dressed and the soundtrack, the great soundtrack. I imagine getting all those songs must have been a project onto itself. Oh, yeah. It like such a killer soundtrack. Um, but the thing that really caught me off guard is I wanted to go in as blindly as I could, but going in, the stories that they related in the book are, they're a little light, they're a little, not flimsy, but they're very light. But here you've got all of like the greatest hits, bringing in all of the different stories and turning them into these short stories. Was that kind of from the outset what you wanted to do or did that evolve over time? That was the premise, that was the pitch. And, and when I went to Pike, it was like, I don't, I don't just wanna do Midnight Club. I do, but I want their stories to be all of your other books. And as many as you can give us, as many as we can fit, you know, into the show. Um, Which is a daunting proposition for someone like, please give us 40% of everything you've Yeah. Oh, right. um, it's, it's, you know, requires a lot of trust on his part, but that was baked into it from the, the start as such an opportunity to turn this into a celebration of so much of what he does so well. Um, then it was just about finding the right story to fit the right character and the right kind of moment in the series. Um, which is one where we had we had enough options to you know really be able to second guess everything. So, uh, but yeah, if and if we're if the show goes on, we have no idea if it will. Um, but it was designed so that if it did, we'd be able to mine even more of his stuff and and really kind of really turn it into a, a full Pike retrospective. But um, we'll we'll see how it goes. Oh, you to those before, to those after, 
with us now. And to Don't those beyond. Be that I kind of got that feeling watching it that there is that potential so obviously not planning too far ahead but would that be something that you would continue to mine his works would he have input on adding new stories or would you think that would be something you would all develop internally well I we'd start by mining his works he's talked about having new ideas for the show and so that's something we'd encourage um, and he's writing again he's writing he's got a book he's almost finished with you know that could be a new pike book out on the market I haven't gotten to read it yet, and I feel resentful about that. I feel like we should be able to read it first, <laughs> but, um, but uh, yeah, and we're, I'm sure we will. You're a frequent flyer, I'm sure. Yeah, but um, but uh, but yeah, the I think it would be awesome to have him create something bespoke for the series. Um, we'll just have to see what the appetite is out there in the marketplace for more of this. Uh, and that's the first time we've ever we've ever had this issue with our work. We've always done limiteds because we could end it and run away. Mm -hmm. And now we have to like endure the suspense of <laughs> whether or not there's gonna be more. But, um, but yeah, we'll see. Well, with the looking at various elements and all the things that were peppered in there, and obviously with all of the works that you have you both done so far, it did definitely strike me that there's little Stephen King call outs in the series as well. And I have to ask because so far your career has kind of turned into a bucket list of all my dream projects coming true. And I saw that there is the one scene where Dusty's holding the Dark Tower. Is there any possibility that you two would be up for adapting that, whether it's Netflix or as a film or something? Because that has just never been done. And I think you would be ideal for it. Well, we agree with you. Uh, we would very much love it if we got to do that. Um, look, that is, you're, you're identifying what is a thousand percent my dream project. Um, as to whether or not it's possible, you know, nothing's impossible. Um, this town and this business are insane. And that property, more than I think anything else that King has, has been fraught with false starts and, you know, almost made it and, you know, misfires, I, I think is safe to say with the movie. Um, so it has it has challenges to get on its feet, uh, but nothing would make us happier than to be able to do Dark Tower. And um, we're going to keep trying to make that a reality until someone else tells us we have to stop. So um, thank you for putting it out there in the universe, Alex. Yes. I hope yeah. it comes true. I really appreciate your time. The show was phenomenal. I absolutely loved it. Can't wait for people to check it out. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Pleasure talking to you. You take good care. And I love Thanks, your shirt. Thanks, Alex. Oh, super cool That's shirt. That's a great shirt. Yeah. <laughs>